Tonight on the Donlin Report, the nation riveted by the testimony of Kyle Rittenhouse in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Did he change minds, both inside and outside the jury box? Plus, an unexpected four-day weekend for a lot of school districts across the country. What's behind this? Are teachers burned out or fighting the mandates? Education quickly becoming a top issue across the country, and we have it covered for you tonight. And remember the migrants under a bridge in Del Rio, Texas? A lot of them are still here in New Mexico waiting for lawyers. I'm going to ask the former head of Homeland Security, what does the law say about that? Why don't they have lawyers? A lot to get at tonight. Great to have you with us. Live from our Chicago studios, the Donlin Report starts right now. The nation paused today to watch Kyle Rittenhouse take the stand. The question is, did he change anyone's mind? That's the pulse of America tonight. Were you swayed by what you heard today? More importantly, was the jury. The key moment was when Rittenhouse broke down on the stand when asked about the events on the night of August 25th last year. There were three people right there. Take a deep breath, Kyle. <laughs> That's what I. <laughs> That's what I run. <laughs> Critics say those were crocodile tears. That, at this point, though, is up to the jury. Still, the defense took a calculated risk putting the 18-year-old on the stand in his own defense. And you could argue Rittenhouse came across as something of an eagle scout. I was a swimmer. Um, I enjoyed working. I was a lifeguard, um, hanging out with friends, going to the beach, just normal teenage stuff. I was a firefighter EMT cadet at Antioch Fire Department. We would go out and ask if anybody needed any first aid assistance, and we would see if there were any fires, and we would put them out. And I said, if there's anything I can do, please reach out to me. So I didn't do anything wrong. I defended myself. A lot of people probably didn't expect to see this Kyle Rittenhouse today, especially considering how he's been portrayed by many over the past 14 months. Tonight, the nation debates what happened in that courtroom in suburban Wisconsin, and so do we, with criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Arthur Idala, and former prosecutor and criminal defense attorney Nicole DeBoer. Great to have you both. Arthur, let's start with you. Would you have put him on the stand? It's a, it's a risky move. Yeah, but I don't think you have a choice. When you're, you know, you have two people who are dead, right? And you have another guy who was almost dead who, who gets shot. And you're going with the self-defense, and, and it all hinges on the individual, the defendant, whomever it is here, Mr. Rittenhouse's perception of what was going on. And he has to convince that jury that he thought his life was in danger to the point where he's allowed to use deadly physical force. This isn't a case where he punched someone in the face. This is a case where he killed someone. So he had to go on. He was well prepared by his defense attorney. And, uh, you know, I mean, I have certain feelings, but my feelings don't matter about how he did. It's really about those jurors sure. and whether they believe uh, he, well, his perception feelings, was, was reasonable. Um, my perception, my feelings were when I, when I watched the prosecutor showing the, uh, the video of him mm -hmm. walking around with that rifle, what you said accurately, Joe, is, you know, he came off as an Eagle Scout and he did on direct examination. And then you see him coming around, walking around Around, this kid, this 17-year-old kid with no military training, with this real weapon of mass destruction. You know, if I'm the prosecutor, I'm like, you know, why, why was he there? He's, right. he's the one who caused this. He's the one who made this happen. He wasn't mowing his front lawn and two guys came at him right. and he killed them. He went and found the trouble. So, I, yeah. but, you know, the, I, I'm a, a New York person. Well, let's see how people in Wisconsin feel I want to ask you about that in a minute, Arthur. But in the meantime, Nicole, let's get you in on this because I guess the question after watching this today, is who is this guy? I mean, is he a, a lifeguard with a fanny pack or was he a guy out looking for trouble and found it? You know, I think this risk was enormous. And I would have said prior to this day, absolutely do not put him on the stand, despite the fact that this was essentially promised by the defense team in opening argument. Uh, but the reality is, is that it went as perfectly as it could have gone for the defense. 
Indeed, he was very prepared to testify. Lots of very humanizing qualities came out on the stand uh, when Rittenhouse testified, and it was an outstanding job. Arthur, let's get back to your point now that we have you back in on this, because there was a lot spent today on why you were there, Kyle Rittenhouse. There was a curfew. Why were you still there after? Why did you drive to this community with a gun and, and, and take up arms? Is any of that relevant, or does this in the end just come down to whether he is doing this in self-defense? No, I think that's all very relevant when you, you know, there, there are two lives lost here and one almost lost. And that's, I mean, that's what the prosecutor has to hammer home. And, 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 you know, he made it, I thought he made an excellent point, the prosecutor, when he talked about him having to use Google Maps to get to the location that he knew where the location was. Well, why did you need Google Maps? Well, some roads were closed. The prosecutor goes, oh, for construction? He goes, no, because of the, because of the riots. Oh, and why were they closed? Because there was a curfew, right? And you knew about the curfew so you disobeyed the curfew you have this weapon that you're not you're too young to have look joe he's definitely getting convicted on possessing a weapon that he's not old enough to have there's no defense to that mm -hmm. and uh, one thing i've always looked at when people break down crying on the stand because as a defense attorney i'm often dealt with that uh, have to deal with that with a complainant there i always look for liquid is there tears coming out of their eyes is there some mucus coming out of their nose and his liquid was all dry but again he's in a very different jury pool that i'm used to practicing before in the tri-state area here in new york so their perception may be very different than mine yeah we will see nicole the other big moment today came when the judge uh, scolded the prosecutor for for trying to get certain testimony in and the judge got pretty hot let's listen to a little bit of that why would you think that that made it okay for you without any advance notice to bring this matter before the jury. You are already, you were, I, I was a, astonished when you began your examination by commenting on the defendant's post-arrest silence. That's basic law, it's been basic law in this country for 40 years, 50 years. I have no idea why you would do something like that. So Nicole, how unusual was that and, and what happened? Shocking. I mean, this prosecutor really ran the risk, and it still may happen that this case is over because of his conduct. It is absolutely inexcusable for a prosecutor to discuss someone's choice to remain silent. This is a constitutional law principle, and it is absurd that this prosecutor crossed the line. And then this prosecutor went a step further uh, with the pretrial ruling and essentially chose uh, to knowingly disregard the instructions he'd received from the judge. And this judge had had it. I'm a little surprised, quite frankly, that the judge just didn't declare a mistrial right then and there. But I think this judge really wants this jury to be the ones rendering a decision in this case. Yeah, he said he'd take it under advisement, as I recall. Uh, Arthur, why did he feel threatened when others around him didn't? Was there a legitimate threat to his life? What are the key questions in this case? Well, you know, the, probably the biggest fact he has in his favor is that when he's being chased by the first victim and that victim throws the bag at him, someone behind him discharges a weapon. It's, right. There's a gunshot. So the argument there from, from the, the defense attorney is, and he also testified that he heard someone say, get him, kill him. So now he's hearing someone saying, get him, kill him. Cut his heart he's out. He's hearing a gunshot. And, and right, exactly. And, and, and now he's got something being thrown at him. But the flip side is, as the prosecutor, if I was the prosecutor, I would break it down like moment by moment, second by second and say, does do you, someone's throwing their bag of clothes from the hospital at you and you hear a gunshot far away, does that justify? It's all about justifiability. Right. Does that justify you basically executing the first person and then when the second person comes to disarm you, does it justify you executing that person? And then when the third person comes over to break it up, does it justify right. you shooting them? Again, it's good, those 12 jurors have a hard job ahead of them. Nicole, things slowed down considerably after the fireworks we've shown here tonight. How do you think the prosecution did on cross? I don't think they touched him. Um, I don't think that the questions that the prosecution asked at the end of the day really moved the ball back down the field in the prosecution's favor at all. Um, the real risk here was calling a defendant to the stand. Rittenhouse chose to testify. He was fully prepared. And I don't think that the prosecution made any real significant points on cross. Arthur, thank you very much. Nicole, we appreciate your time as well. It's great to have you both. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having us.
The investigation into the weekend's deadly crowd crush at the Astro World Festival in Houston will take weeks and possibly even months. That word today from the Houston Police Chief Tony Finner. More than 20 lawsuits have already been filed accusing organizers of failing to take simple crowd control steps or staff properly. News Nation's Brian Enton has the latest for us. He joins us from Houston tonight. Brian. Joe, the numbers remain unchanged right now. Eight confirmed dead, but we learned that there are two people, according to the chief, in extremely critical condition. He emphasized that this is now an ongoing uh, criminal investigation. He says whoever needs to be held accountable will be held accountable. Uh, and he said the Houston Police Department will conduct this investigation. There's been a lot of questions about that because the chief does have a relationship with Travis Scott, as do other leaders within the city. We asked the chief about that. We Chief, we know you have a relationship with Travis Scott, as do other leaders in the city. Do you think you can fairly investigate this, and do you think there should be an independent? Let me clarify something. I'm glad you asked that. I'm a 54-year-old man, 32 years on this. I meet a lot of people. I was born and raised in here in Houston. So if you, if, if somebody's referring to a special relationship, if you call meeting him twice, special relationship, and I'm not being smart. I just want to be open and transparent. Uh, that's not a close relationship to me. I've only spoken to him twice. So the chief was very clear there. He says he does not have a special relationship with Travis Scott. We also asked him at the end of the day, who was responsible for shutting this concert down when all of this chaos was happening? He said ultimately it was up to the production company and the entertainer. Joe. Brian, the other thing that stood out to me was the update on the security guard. There was talk that he had been pricked in the neck and that someone might have injected him with something. The chief talked about that as well. Yeah, this was so interesting because remember, it was the police chief on Saturday who said at a press conference that there was this security guard who was pricked in the neck and possibly injected with something. Well, today, the police chief did a 180, said that that was just things that they were hearing at the time. They finally made contact, uh, contact with the security guard, and he says the security guard says he wasn't pricked with anything. He actually got punched out uh, and was knocked out and that it had nothing to do with an injection. Part of why, as the chief said, this will likely take weeks, if not months. Brian Edden live for us tonight in Houston. Brian, thanks for the update. Thanks, Joe. Remember that Alice Cooper song, School's Out? Well, on Friday, schools across the country, a lot of them will be out for another reason, though. Staffing shortages. As many teachers call in sick, are they protesting vaccine mandates in their states, or is it something else? And a tale of two states. As new COVID restrictions begin in California this week, Florida suddenly has the lowest infection level in the country. I'll speak with one man who says his recent trip to Florida was all sunshine. Dave Rubin joins us ahead. And don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. Back after this. An announcement for students and parents in Seattle, Denver, Chicago, and Northeast Ohio. No school this Friday. In some parts, it's leaving parents frustrated and even scrambling for child care. In Seattle, it comes after more than 600 teachers called off, with school officials saying more requests were coming in. Students are poised for a four-day weekend with Veterans Day on Thursday tomorrow, just a week before the long Thanksgiving weekend. Seattle Public Schools telling parents we are aware of an unusually large number of Seattle Public Schools staff taking leave on Friday and do not believe we have adequate, adequate personnel to open schools. Although no one's calling it a sick out yet, the shutdowns come amid rising tensions between parents and educators. Some saying school politics helped change the outcome of Virginia's recent gubernatorial election. Democratic strategist Kevin Chavis and national political reporter for The Hill, Julia Manchester, join us now. So, Julia, what stands out to me here is that this isn't just one city or one school district. This is happening in a number of them across the, stra the, uh, the state, uh, the uh, country for that matter. But what, what do we call this if it isn't a sick out? Is it a walkout? What is it? It's organized, obviously. Right. Well, there's quite
clearly some sort of pushback against, um, you know, whether it's a vaccine mandate or how this is all being handled in these school districts. And I think this is really reflects an overarching national feel that there is discontent with the education system, whether it's among teachers or teachers unions or even among students and parents. You know, we're seeing these walkouts, we're seeing these contentious uh, school board meetings in states like Florida, Virginia, and really across the country. So heading into the midterms next year, Joe, I think we really need to pay attention to how the issue of education and education related issues is really tackled. Kevin, what's the message here to you? Is it is it fatigue? Is it frustration? Is it something more? Well, one of the things I think we've all done since this pandemic started is try to take little things and make blanket judgments about what we're seeing. And it's hard to know exactly what's going on with this virus. Personally, I read this story and I think that a lot of the teachers, they say, hey, we have this weird Thursday holiday and now we're stuck with this sort of floating school day on Friday. Hey, let's just make it a four day weekend. I think, you know, any of us who've had jobs that provide leave, we know people take advantage of those opportunities and they all want to take leave on those mm. days. I think it's more of that um, in Seattle, uh, but I think in other places in the country, like you talked about Virginia or Florida, right. Ohio. Um, I think it depends mm. on what's going on there. Yeah, Ohio. I think a lot of it depends on the numbers they're seeing. Um, our hospitalizations down, our new cases down. Uh, those are things that I think are determining what these um, authorities are doing. And it's different everywhere. What's good for somewhere like Seattle may not be what's good for somewhere like Florida, where they've seen, you know, massive drop in cases, for example. So I think it depends on where you are. But to me, this seemed like, hey, some teachers and some of the employees just want a four day weekend. I can't really blame wow. them. All right. Well, Julia, <laughs> we did see this in Virginia, as you mentioned. It's a race you followed closely there. The governor's race. Education is the new front, really. In politics, or so it seems, you just saw the headline from Politico there. This is more than about uh, critical race theory. In some cases, parents, and they did it again in Loudoun County last night. They were back at that board saying basically that the board had lost the trust of the county. This isn't, uh, uh, isn't necessarily going away. No, it isn't. And even uh, less than 24 hours after the Virginia governor's race and Glenn Youngkin declared victory, you saw the National Republican Congressional Campaign Committee adding Jennifer Wexton's district. She's the congresswoman who represents the 10th district of Virginia, which happens to include Loudoun County to its offensive target list. That is not by coincidence. I've talked to Republicans who have really compared what we're seeing with the parental rights movement in mm. much of the conservative community to the Tea Party movement. Now, whenever I talk to Democrats, they caution that and say, look, this worked in a Virginia governor's race. This worked in these House of Delegates races or the lieutenant governor's race, more state and local races. We are heading into a cycle that's going to be dominated by federal races in the House and the Senate. So it's unclear how re Republicans are able to take this what is normally seen as a state or local issue when it comes to education and school boards and nationalize it. So I think both sides are really starting to prepare to go on the offensive and get ahead of each other on this issue so they can get ahead of that news cycle, which sure. is so sort of obsessed right now with education. Right. Kevin, how do Democrats jump in on this? Because right now it looks like Republicans are, are winning on it. Right. And it's a big problem. You know, I think that Terry McAuliffe made a huge mistake when he made that comment that was played on loop and, you know, over right. and over again about parents shouldn't tell schools what to teach. Uh, that was a mistake. And I, I don't know if he really believed that the way he said it, but the way it came off, uh, I think that hurt him. And I think that ultimately is why he lost. And I think we also learned that you can't just run on sort of being anti-Trump. I mean, a lot of people uh, despise Trump, but he also has his supporters. But we have to make the pitch to the voters what we're going to do. And one of the things that is not a winning message is that we're going to go against parents or we're going to fight against parents' ability to weigh in on what schools are teaching and weigh in on the curriculum. So this is something we have to take seriously. And I think um, a lot of Democrats are starting to figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that I've been of asking for my party to do for a while. I'm from D.C. We have a very robust school choice movement and school choice options for parents. And I'm a parent myself, so that's something that's very important to me. And I think we have to show that we're a party that supports parents and aren't working against their efforts to make sure schools are doing right by their kids. Right. 
A lot of issues ahead for the country, for sure, in this particular category. I know almost a million kids, 5 to 11, got that vaccine in the first week. So what's ahead for schools? Are we looking at more mandates? What happens with these districts? It's something we'll certainly keep our eye on. Democratic strategist Kevin Chavis and national political reporter for The Hill, Julia Manchester. Great to have you both. Thank you. It's a tale of two states, California versus Florida, in the fight against COVID-19. This week, the city of Los Angeles enacted some of the nation's strictest COVID-19 vaccine verification rules. Now, businesses must check your vaccination status when you go out shopping or go to a restaurant, movie theater, hair and nail salons, gyms, museums, bowling alleys, and other spaces as well. Meantime, in Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis announced a series of bills aimed at cutting back President Biden's new federal COVID-19 vaccine requirements saying we've got to stop the coercion. We've got to stop browbeating people. Now, the interesting thing here is California's coronavirus rate is double that of Florida, which is at seven cases per 100,000 people. California is at 16 cases per 100,000. Our next guest lives in California, but just returned from a week-long trip to Florida and says the difference is pretty amazing. Joining me now is our regular Dave Rubin, host of the Rubin Report on YouTube and the author of Don't Burn This Book. All right, Dave, what'd you see out there in Florida? <laughs> well, Joe, you are right. I am physically here in California, but I am mentally and spiritually in Florida. I have to tell you, I mean, it really, it's not just a tale of two cities. It really feels like a different country than here in California. I was out and about, there were people in absolutely packed restaurants, people smiling and having a good time. Streets were packed, coffee shops were packed. And guess what? Some people wore masks. Actually, not a lot of people, but it was your choice if you wanted to wear a mask and if you wanted to be vaccinated. And that's in stark contrast to Los Angeles. I came back right. two or three days ago and everybody's masked up and things are mostly empty and we know about all the closures and everything else, it really, maybe we're seeing a good experiment in the federalist system where states get to do different things, but we're seeing one state, at least in my opinion, run extremely well by a competent governor, Ron DeSantis, obviously that's Florida, and something very different by Gavin Newsom. Why do you Although he did return today. After yeah, I know, well, let's talk absence. about that in a minute, Dave, but why do you think the numbers are higher in California when there are so much tighter restrictions? I mean, look, as you just laid out, you know, the difference between, say, seven out of 100,000 people and 16, it's not, it's not so profoundly different. It sounds like a lot because it is more than double, but there are different factors that play in terms of population density and weather Age. and everything else. But I think, I think the overriding thing is that the lockdowns, the mask mandates, taking the choices away from the people, I think that has been very clearly proven not to work and have an all, uh, a series of other problems related to depression and people being upset and not mm. going to work and, and just the sort of general breakdown of society that we're seeing. Uh, so that it just doesn't work. DeSantis is saying, hey, freedom's a little bit messy. I'm gonna give you guys as much choice as possible. That's much more in line with an America that, that I think we mostly knew for 200 plus years. All right, let's get to Governor Newsom. He went missing for a little while there and the Twitterverse went nuts. Uh, did he have COVID? Did he have a reaction to the vaccine? There was all this speculation. And then he skipped the climate conference in Scotland. And when he resurfaced, here's what he said. And the kids, literally, they kind of had an intervention. They said they couldn't believe that I was going to miss Halloween. Mom and dad missing Halloween. For them, it's you know, like worse than Christmas, missing Christmas. And I woke up that next morning with something that's probably familiar to a lot of parents, that knot in your stomach, that I had no damn choice. I had to cancel that trip. All right, Dave, um, as a dad who's missed a lot of Halloweens, I guess we can get that. But I think maybe the bigger question here is not where he should have been, but where was he? And why didn't he just come out and say, if it's Halloween, then just say it, right? Disappearing is only going to fuel all this speculation. Absolutely. Look, the guy disappeared for 11 days after getting that jab where he flexed his muscles and it's so great and we should jab all of these kids even though we don't know exactly what it's going to do according to the FDA panelists themselves. Uh, he disappeared. Why, why didn't he just say something on video to say that he's okay? You know, there are a couple articles written. There's one in the Daily Mail today from insider sources within the family that say he did have some sort of adverse reaction with muscle fatigue. I can't tell you independently that's absolutely true, but there are people reporting that. But the bigger issue is that this guy's out there. He's a, he's a total media uh, right. lover, right? He's out in the media all the time. So for 11 days in the midst of this pandemic where he wants everyone to be jabbed endlessly, he disappeared. Something doesn't really add up. 
All right, let's get you on the Aaron Rodgers story, Dave. He and the Packers have now been fined over this COVID situation. He talked about the latest developments on that yesterday. I shared an opinion that is polarizing. I get it. And I misled some people about my status, which I take full responsibility of, those comments. But in the end, I have to stay true to who I am and what I'm about. And I stand behind the things that I said. So, Dave, here we go again. This is another lesson from mom. Just don't lie about it, right? I mean, if he had said that in the very beginning, we probably wouldn't be where we are right now. That There's a plan in place. He didn't follow it. And then he lied about it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, Joe, you obviously know my position on vaccine mandates. I'm completely against mandates either from the federal government or certainly from private businesses. I have no right to force my director who's sitting a few feet away from me to inject anything in his body. But if the company has a policy, you can't lie about it. Now, you have to figure out how, how to deal with that. And it's very difficult for athletes who are thrown into all of these situations and having to comment on all of the cultural and political things of the day. But I do think we have to be able to separate that you can be pro-vax or anti-vax while at the same time being pro-mandate or anti-mandate. These are, these are completely separate things. An individual choice for you is different than saying that the federal government especially uh, has to force everyone to do whatever it wants, whenever it wants. While at the same time, Joe, we know that the vaccines are not working as promised and you know we were told okay you'd be completely safe and the country would be open and now we know well you can actually still transmit covid you can still get covid and everything else and now booster shot after booster shot so a little honesty yeah would go a long way right now across the board all right dave rubin any plans to move to florida or are you staying there um we <laughs> shall see <laughs> okay all right yeah we, we're gonna break some news i guess with dave rubin on the move dave good to see you thanks we shall see Thanks. All right, is Texas planning to secede? Well, not yet, but it could happen, according to Senator Ted Cruz. Here's what the Texas Republican told students at Texas A&M University last month. And if there comes a point where it's hopeless, then I think we take NASA, we take the military, we take the oil. <laughs> Joining me now, former Texas state legislator and the founder of the Patriot Academy, Rick Green. Rick, uh, <laughs> seceding from the U.S., uh, he's going after Big Bird. What in the world has happened to him? <laughs> Well, the biggest problem with uh, the scenario he laid out is he didn't include in and out. I don't know if Texans can live without in and out. And since right. California has a lock on that one, uh, it would be it would be difficult. Now, look, I, I think, look, you got to start ta talking about uh, how serious the situation is. Every freedom loving American, every constitutional loving American, every red, white and blue American wants us to stay together as a nation. Sure. I think Ted's definitely in that category, but he's acknowledging that, you know, history tells us it could get so bad that a nation cannot stay together, uh, cannot uh, continue to live together if they're so far apart on their policies and their, their belief systems. I hope we don't get to that point, but you, I think it's a legit conversation to have. Are you serious? I mean, do you really think we're getting to that point? I, I, it's hard for me to believe, Rick. I, I, at some point, I mean, aren't, as you said, aren't we all in this together? Good, bad, well, we should be, and, and I hope we continue to be. Look, every every uh, state had people that died for me at uh, Iwo Jima and at other places to, to protect my freedom. So I want us to stay together for that reason, but also so that we're stronger as a nation. I think we're stronger together, and to, and to prevent China from taking over the world, we need to stay together as a nation. I think what Senator Cruz is saying is there are scenarios where we would not be stronger as a nation. There are scenarios where our federal government gets so out of line that we're no longer stronger because we have a San Francisco cabal forcing its values on the entire nation. Uh, look, the British never did a lot of the things that our federal government is now doing. The British never tried to micromanage our kids' education, never tried to force the medical decisions on our family and, and our kids. Well, you've I mean, got all kinds of autonomy there in bad. Texas, Rick. You know that. I mean, the governor's passing all kinds of laws that are only, uh, you know, in effect in Texas. You guys have all kinds of autonomy. Uh, well, in some areas, sure. But what we've got now is a federal government completely outside its constitutional authority and doing things that it does not have authority to do. When, when you start actually forcing the entire nation to live in la-la land with San Francisco and you start saying boys are going to go into girls' bathrooms, locker rooms, and, and showers, and you're going to do that whether you want to do it or not, those are the kind of things where p parents are saying, no, forget it. I mean, that's why you have a parent revolt right now in the nation. It's not just critical race theory. It's a lot and of the I'm other sure things. I'm sure Texas has outlawed that, right? 
Well, yes, but the federal government, if you look at the stated policies of Joe Biden, of, of uh, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, they want to override that. They seem to think, according to Jen Psaki, that, that federal law always overturns state law, which is not what the Constitution says in the Supremacy Clause. It's got to be in pursuance thereof. Um, so they want to force those things. Here's the bad thing about it, right? Red states should be able to be red states, blue states, blue, purple, purple, whatever. The problem is right now they're using the federal government to make red states pay for the bad decisions of blue states. We're taking our money and bailing out their bad decisions. So taxation without representation was bad under the king. What's worse is regulation without representation, all of these OSHA rules, unconstitutional, no representation from the fourth branch that is now going to micromanage our health decisions and our employment situations. It's out of control. I think we can still save the nation, but we have to put the federal government back in its box and let each state have its own personality, be its own, as the founding fathers called, laboratory of freedom, and not try to make all Americans the exact same. That's the only thing that will keep us together as a nation. One of the latest numbers I found, Rick, Texas gets about $40 billion from the federal government, which is the second largest revenue source for the state. Can you live without that? I'd be glad to live without that because we also would not send the tens of billions of dollars that we do. We, we're actually a negative receiving state. We yeah. send more than we actually receive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's get you one more thing on this uh, Ted Cruz thing with, with Big Bird, because one of my colleagues here suggested that he's just trolling all of us. Uh, he knows what kind of response this is going to get. Um, you know, is this just him playing to the Trump Republicans in the party? Or, you know, I guess another way to put it, is he crazy? Is he crazy like a fox? I think he's probably crazy like a fox. Ted's one of the most brilliant guys I know, knows the Constitution better than anybody uh, that I know. And so he knows what he's talking about, and he knows, also knows how to play the game. And, right. and, and I think he's trying to get people to think about big questions that need to be discussed. What is the proper role of the federal government? And thankfully, uh, Joe Biden just uh, woke up 100 million Americans as he tries to use this OSHA rule to force the vaccine on them. Man. And they're now asking the question, what you're, is the proper role of the federal government? You're just loaded for bear tonight, Rick. Let me get you quickly on Matthew McConaughey because I'm out of time. He told yeah. the New York Times he would not support vaccine mandates for kids just yet. Do you think he runs for governor there? You know, Republican or Democrat, you got to admit, McConaughey oozes coolness. Uh, I don't know if he oozes enough coolness uh, to fill in the gaps on the political issues. But look, he's a guy that should be a part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I think he's a thinking guy. Um, I don't agree with him on some of his gun control issues and other things, but it would sure make things interesting. It would. All right, all right, all right. Rick Green, thanks for the time. Good <laughs> to right. see you. Thanks, Joe. Good to see you, man. Remember the Haitian migrants under the bridge in Del Rio, Texas? Could they now join the list to get payments from the government over their treatment? Our acting secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, will ask him about that. He'll answer some questions next. The ACLU is calling attention to the ongoing issue at the southern border concerning Haitian migrants who came to the U.S. back in September. At one point, there were an estimated 15,000 migrants, most of them Haitian, camped out under a bridge in Del Rio for days. Many of them were sent to Haiti, others to various detention facilities in the U.S. for processing. And now, roughly two months later, the ACLU says at least 45 asylum seekers are still being held in a detention facility in New Mexico, some of which have not been able to present their asylum case or seek legal counsel. The ACLU is demanding ICE give these migrants access to legal services and halt the deportations of the migrants. ICE has a Friday deadline to meet these demands. Joining me now, always good to have former acting DHS Secretary Chad Wolf. Um, Chad, 30,000 feet today on this thing. I, I just don't understand it. I don't want to get bogged down in the weeds on how this happens, but don't they have to be processed one way or another within a certain amount of time? Well, they certainly do have to be processed, but I think what you're seeing here is the overwhelming number of individuals coming across that border in any given month is overwhelming the system. So you can bet that there are backlogs. You can bet that there is extensive time in the immigration system to process these individuals and to have their asylum claim either heard by an immigration judge there on site or have it uh, remotely heard. Uh, but when you have a historic border crisis like we see and the, the system is overwhelmed, there probably will be delays at the end of the day. But look, uh, DHS, law enforcement officers are doing their best. Yeah. Uh, but as I said, they are overwhelmed. Is there a better way, Chad, to set up the system to address the number of people coming here claiming asylum in particular? I mean, as you said, we're we're overwhelmed here. What's the answer? 
Well, we had that answer. Uh, we had it built in 2019 and operating in 19 and 20. And what we called it is the Remain in Mexico program or the migrant protection protocols, where we would process individuals, but we had them wait in Mexico and we had them in an orderly fashion come back into the United States and here, uh, you know, have their immigration court proceedings. Uh, but we knew exactly how many were entering so that we could process them in an orderly way. Um, and I think that's the only way that's going to work at the end of the end of the day, because you're going to continue to see folks coming across that border claiming asylum. We know that 90 percent never qualify for it uh, and you're going to overwhelm the system. So there's got to be a way to make this a more orderly process so that uh, there could be planning involved and that folks understand what that time frame is. Chad, are we digging ourselves a hole here, do you think, with the uh, the ACLU filing on behalf of migrants and what if courts decide we owe them money too because they were stuck in detention centers for longer than they should have i always seem to ask you this but how do we get to an immigration plan that works well it's a great question look the aclu is going to file lawsuits that's what they did i think they filed upwards of 400 different lawsuits during the trump administration and until you have open borders and until you let every individual come across that border and stay in the country you're going to continue to have lawsuits by the ACLU and other NGOs that want to see this. So um, I think there's always improvements that can be made. You need some reforms done by Congress, but you also need a willing executive. You need a president that's going to stand up and secure the border, uh, reform that immigration system, you know, root out the fraud in that immigration system and eliminate that catch and release system that we see that doesn't work for Americans. It doesn't work for the migrants. Um, but you've got to have some leadership there. And I think that's what's lacking at the end of the day. Right. Speaking of payments, Chad, you didn't come in until after this, but can we all now with hindsight as 2020 agree that separating these families wasn't a good idea? Well, when you talk about zero tolerance, sure, it's it's, it's about enforcing the law. And I think I, you know, I've said numerous times I agree with the president when he ended that practice. But I think it's important to remember that, uh, you know, the Bush administration, Obama administration and even the Biden administration are prosecuting individuals. Uh, sometimes families as they cross that border, depending on what's you know in their in their background. So this happens every day. Um, I think there's got to be a way. You know, DHS certainly could have done better, making sure that we match those families and those in those children back up together at the end of the day. Uh, but when you talk about payment, you talk about you know the four hundred fifty thousand dollars that the Biden administration is now reportedly negotiating with the ACLU is absolutely the wrong approach. There is absolutely no reason to reward individuals for breaking the law and coming across that border illegally. You, wasn't just, this, you don't do that. Wasn't this going to happen anyway, though, Chad? I mean, agree with it or not, this was going to end up in court, to your point, where the ACLU sues, and now the Justice Department just tries to find a way to settle it. So it's been in the court. It's been in the court for over two years. Uh, not only has DHS brought these uh, parents back from, uh, you know, whether it's Mexico or Honduras or Guatemala, back to the U.S. at taxpayer expense. They have reunited them with their uh, child. And what the ACLU wants you to believe is not only is that not enough, not only paroling them into the country for years at a time, that's not enough that you now need to pay them. And I think it's important to remember, look, every day, families are separated here in the United States. If the parent commits a crime and goes to jail or prison, Guess what? They don't take their child with them. They're separated. And that that family is broken up. But yet the Biden administration is not talking about paying them. Instead, they're focusing on paying foreign nationals who broke our law. And I think that's wrong. Former DHS Secretary Chad Wolf, good to have you. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Let's check in now with Leland Vitter. On Balance starts at the top of the hour. What do you have tonight? The new normal in Washington. Normal is sort of an ambiguous word, but there are Democrats now who are trying to use it to define themselves, normal Democrats versus socialist Democrats. So you've got the fight between rhinos and MAGA and right. Republican side. Now you have the fight between normal and progressives on the left. Interesting, this redefinement in terms, it was the progressives who tried to uh, brand all the Democrats, like Joe Manchin and others, as either conservative Democrats or corporate Democrats. And now they're trying to retake their own naming. I need a scorecard, I think. Well, what do we say? Politics is the new American sport? That's right. It is indeed. Nice early appearance, too, in the background. That was, that was slick. Well, you know, you got to get all the promotion you can. <laughs> all the airtime. All right. Leland joins us at the top of the hour with On Balance. Meantime, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for visitors at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier as many pay their respect for the fallen. That's our American Snapshot next.
As we inch closer to Thanksgiving, prices on everything from food and gas to our homes continue to rise. A report from the Labor Department today showed prices jumped more than 6% from last year, the largest one-year jump in more than 30 years. And that translates into a whole lot of cheddar for the average family. Last night, we calculated increased gas costs of more than $118 a month for a family with two drivers using the national average for miles driven per day and the rise in gas prices since last year. Again, that's a family with two drivers. Food and beverage costs also up more than 5% since last year, meaning if you spent $500 a month on groceries, that same shopping cart will now cost you $525. The rise in prices offsets a record rise in wages. As of September, American workers are getting paid 4.2% more than last year, but as we pointed out, that does not keep up with the rising prices, up 6.2%. And not even Santa is immune to all of this. It's looking like St. Nick will be in high demand this year, like with most other workers, with no one to fill his big black boots. COVID concerns and the labor shortage have contributed to, you got it, a Santa shortage. Some Santas are currently charging between $175 to $300 an hour, depending on where they live and the number of hours for the gig. Still some ways to see Santa online, though, such as Santa's Club, Zoom Santa Claus, and Sealed by Santa. Hopefully, you kids get a chance to share their list. And as we get set to mark Veterans Day tomorrow, our American Snapshot tonight focuses on the Crow Nation, paying their respect at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. This year marks the centennial of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, representing lost U.S. service members whose remains have not been identified. 100 years ago, President Harding chose Chief Plenty Coup of the Crow Tribe to represent all American Indian tribes at that ceremony in 1921. This week also marks the second week of Native American Heritage Month. By the way, Crow Nation performed smudging it's a ceremony for purifying or cleansing the soul of negative thoughts of a person or place before paying their respects. This is, by the way, the first time in 96 years that visitors have been allowed to approach the tomb and lay flowers. You could get close originally, but not get up and lay flowers. Arlington National Cemetery anticipates another day, quote, in our lifetimes when the public is able to approach the tomb in this matter, but certainly a powerful opportunity for a lot of people, hopefully not a once in a lifetime opportunity. Great way certainly to celebrate Veterans Day, which again, as we pointed out, is tomorrow. And so we'll give an early salute to all of those who've served. That's our time for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great evening on balance with Leland Bitter coming up next. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.